Craig Charles, self-styled Scally in your alley, Scouse in your house, is the 27-year-old star of BBC's Red Dwarf. And unless he wants his dairy air minced like bag of meat, <laughs> he better be history in two seconds flat. Thanks to enlightenment, recon mission complete. Transmit with speed. Enlightenment quickly, please. He is also a poet, and though he has been writing poems since he was 13, his big break came with a resident slot on Wogan. You go to the shops and you go to the shows and the snot keeps dripping out of everybody's <laughs> nose. It's all anoraks and duffel coats, woolen scarves and mitts. It stayed for far too long and now it's getting on me nerves. <laughs> But every poet rhymes with rhymes as beans. His mix of humour, social observation and frantic delivery was a big success. And he has been much in demand on television and radio ever since. Recently, he was given his first chance as a serious actor in the BBC drama The Marksman, in which he played the role of a Liverpudlian villain. There's lots of crooks about. I know, cos two of them hit me the other night. As if he hadn't got enough problems being five foot six and lumbered with a name like McFadden. His man in the street image was recently used to good effect on the series Them and Us, in which he championed the causes of individuals who felt they had been abused by authority. Craig Charles, can you remember the first poem you ever wrote and no. what it was about? <laughs> can you remember yeah. what it was about? Yeah, I, in fact, that's the first poems I used to write were about unemployment and things like that, you know, when I was about 30. But uh, one, of, one of the first poems I wrote was a love poem to this girl lived, it was in my class, and it was like, I want to feel your bum. <laughs> but I know you'll slap me hand and every time I see you smile it makes me alter ego stand I want to kiss your lips but I'm scared about me breath I want to hold your hand but I'm half frightened to death I want to drop formalities I want to let my fingers roam but my mum's banging on the ceiling telling me to take you home I want to take you to the pictures but your studies in the way and leaving can be grieving when you always want to stay I want to marry you this instant and let my feelings delve but my dad said I'll have to wait because I'm only 12 <laughs> right, we're going to have no trouble getting you to talk, that's obvious. <laughs> Steve? Um, are most of your poems comedy, or are they, some of them, straight? Well, can I, yeah, interesting you say that. Quite an interesting question, no? <laughs> um, <laughs> They used to be. Um, when I was writing for television, I used to do a lot of poems on TV, and when I was writing for TV, uh, they kind of wanted me to use my poetry as a vehicle for my sense of humour. So that's kind of why I stopped doing poems on television and moved into other areas. Simply because I thought I was sacrificing the quality of my poetry, simply to be funny, to get a gag in, you know? And that's not really what poetry is about, so I stopped. Plus, I didn't kind of want to be labelled as a poet for the rest of my life, you know? Because once you establish yourself in the nation's consciousness as any one thing, they won't let you be anything else. Do you still see yourself as a poet, primarily? Yeah, very much so. I see, see myself more as a, of a, as a poet now than I did in them days, yeah? Because of the, simply because of the standard and the kind of poetry I'm writing. Next question! Tony. Are all your poems so personally, like, uh, I want to feel your bum, or do you sort of temper them more for a more mass market these days? Oh, um, I, I, my poems are less mass market these days. I mean, the poems like, I want to feel your bum, gets a giggle, and everyone goes, Ugh. you know, and, and that's kind of mass market poetry kind of stuff, you know. But like these days, it's more sort of, it's less earthbound, yeah. shall I say. But is it all like personal feelings? Well, it's, I, I write, for, I can only write from my point of view, you know, and the things I see and feel, you know, and you know, the environment and attitude around me. That's why I don't write poems about being on a dole anymore, because I'm not on a dole, so I can't write poems about being on a dole, you know? And if I did, it'd be like, you know, who's he trying a kid? So uh, I don't write poems about being on a dole, and I write things about, you know, everyday life, the things that affect me. Michael? Yes, I've done. Yeah, hello, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> do you like to write, with, well, do you consider yourself to be the Shakespearean type of poet, you know? Thieve, thou and thine, these kind of stuff. You haven't seen my stuff, obviously, my <laughs> uh, No, I don't, but, like, you know, Shakespeare's great if you're into him, you know, I mean, there's... But uh, I just don't think that the nation should be spending 50 million or something like that a year on a, a guy that's uh, been dead for 500 years, you know? When you, were, when you were young, were you ever into him and into his sort of... Well, part, obviously, part of when, you're, when you're at school, you read the books, you have to, don't you, the teacher makes you. Yeah, but did you ever like it? Um, yeah, kind of. I mean, you know, Romeo and Juliet's quite simple and easy to understand, you know. I mean, they're all classic themes, really, Shakespeare. I mean, I don't mind Shakespeare, yeah. but, yeah, I take the mickey out of him, but, you know, he's... everyone's... Uh, you know, when you're a comedian, which I, you know, essentially am as well, then, you know, you can kind of uh, take a pop at everyone. Ernest? Yeah, were you ever skitted at school for writing poetry in that? Because it's not, like, a very hard thing. No, it's a girlies thing, isn't it? <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, yeah, they kind of took the mickey out of me a bit, but, um... I won a poetry competition when I was about 13. And it was like the only thing I could really do at that time, you know, apart from being a disruptive influence in the class, which I was really good at. I mean, I got A's in being a disruptive influence, man. 
But apart from being a disruptive influence, that was the only thing I could do was write these like poems. Did, did, think uh, you, had, did you think so, you had a future in it? Well, I, from an early age, wanted to be a footballer and kind of still do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, um, but I, I thought poetry would be a good substitute. Yeah, I kind of made a living out of just being a poet for the first kind of five years of my career, you know, which is, you know, it's all right. You, know, you can make money at it, but you can't be exceedingly wealthy, you know. Emma? Um, do you find that you can write poetry at any time? Oh, scouser! <laughs> I like, uh, don't, 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 don't. Oh, do you find that um, you have to be in a particular kind of mood swing to be able to write a poem? It's a bit like saying how deep is the ocean, that, because like, there's so many different ways of writing, you know. You, sometimes you can put the pen to paper and it just comes out and, wow, yeah. bang, finished the poem. And other times you get a line a day or, you know, you can rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. Are you always on your own when you think of stuff or can you just be in a situation like this and someone will come to you? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I'm, I'm not always on my own. Sometimes I'm on my own, you know. Yeah. I, I, I kind of write, it's just like, it's just like an everyday function with me, you know. So there could be people in the room and I can get an idea and they've got a piece of paper and a pen, you know, and jot it down. I'm like, I'm always looking for a piece of paper, you know. And uh, so I could be in a group of people, I could be on my own, I could be bored, I could be blessed, could be happy. Mm -hmm. You know, it just depends. It's like, it's, there's, no, there's no rules, there's no hard and fast rules about life, man. You know Lorna, what I mean? Lorna, down the back there. Yeah. Uh, if you don't really like Shakespeare that much as like a, an influence, then. I didn't who, say that. I said well, who, who are your influences? What books do you read? What poets do you like? Um, oh, poets. I like Dylan Thomas simply because he didn't make much sense to me, you know, but I like his use of words. <coughs> And the way he'd use like liquid words and warm words, and he'd like have all these words flowing together, and like you know, but I didn't understand it, and kind of still don't, you know. And um, so I, I like Dylan Thomas, and I like Roger McGough, not because he's a scouser, just because I think his poems are great, you know. I did this poem called Motorway once, which was like politicians who are driving hobnail cars with wheels the size of merry-go-rounds have a new idea. We're going to lay us down side by side and put asphalt in our navels and pebbles in our eye sockets, so we can play a more active road, a, a more active part in the road to destruction. Blew the punchline! <laughs> but like, so I like kind of Roger McGough's poems and things like that, you know? Is there a, is there a clearly definable sort of Liverpool tradition of, of poetry? Because there are others as well. Not really, you know, because like, um, there is a, you know, obviously a tradition, but there's a different style. My style's a complete... I, I, when I used to do Saturday Night Live, um, Stephen Fry said to me, Oh, you're not like most of the Liverpool poets, he said, because you use lots of words in a line. <laughs> 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 and that's kind of true. I mean, a lot of Liverpool poetry is about three words on a, a line all that. And I kind of have long sentences. You must encounter some of that, though, because I'd imagine if the people from, I don't know, Faber and Faber or whoever have just heard that example about I want to feel your bum and all that, they, they, they mightn't be clamouring at your door to publish your work. So have you encountered that sort of uh, difference in what some people oh, perceive as standards, poetry yeah, and um, what you think is poetry? I mean, you know, I, I never used to do the poetry. So I never used to play libraries, you know, with those, like, I call them pension punks. It was like 65 year old women with blue rinses and purple hair looking at all the punks going, Oh, look at his hair, you know. <laughs> I mean, I never used to do those kind of gigs, no. And I have encountered a lot of like a snobbery, you know, from the double battle names and all that around. But, uh, you know, I, I haven't brought a book of poetry out, you know. But I've been offered publishing contracts by people like Faber and Faber. And I've always said no because, you know, I mean, I wouldn't publish that poem now, you know. And if I would have said yet yeah at the time, then I'd be looking back going, Oh, God. <laughs> People would be quoting my work and I'd be hating it, you know, so... But, you know, if there's any publishers watching, uh, I'll have one now. Yeah, I, I, feel, I feel ready now. I didn't feel ready before. OK, in the back here. How did you find your school friends reacted to your writing poetry, boys in particular? They... They thought I was a bit of a wally for doing it, I suppose, <laughs> you know? Um, it's, it's weird, cos... Now, they must all be looking at me and going, oh... Jammy gay, you know? <laughs> so um, they just probably thought I was a bit of a wally. I never really asked, I didn't really care, you know? It was like, uh, so what? I went to a school where there was only black kid in a, in a school of a thousand kids, so like, you know, I was probably pretty weird anyway, you know, to them, you know? I was kind of, I was always a bit of a loner. And that's, I think you have to be in a way, you know, poetry is generally like observing people and, and watching things, and you can do that best when you're on your own. Do you feel um, the way that you were singled out at school possibly helped with your poetry then? Kind of, yeah, because it did make me feel, you know, an outsider to a certain extent. And, uh, and, you know, there was a lot of, you know, things coming in, you know, a lot of information coming in. So when I was on my own and depressed, I could <laughs> always put my thoughts down on a piece of paper. OK, the man who cornered Coltrane, Derek. 
Um, what, what did you? How did you corner Robbie? Tell well, me. Well, that's a good story. You, and I'll tell you <laughs> <laughs> Over a few drinks, mate. Um, <laughs> you far away, then go. Um, I was just wondering, what's like? <laughs> what's like the main purpose to your poetry? Is it just to entertain people, or is it the liberating form of the Western world, or something? That's, is it supposed to change all of our lives, or is it just to make us? make it interested or make it laugh or whatever, is it? Is that well, powerful? <laughs> well, at first it was just to make a living, you know? <laughs> um, no, I mean, you can read... I'm not into this reading things into things a lot of the time. I just kind of take them for granted and take them on face value. And uh, my poetry is not to entertain. It used to be to entertain when I was writing for television, and yet that was, you know... And, that, you know, that was rhyming, really. It was, I was a rhymester, which is like a, a lower form of poet, you know, simply because, you know, I used to do Wogan every week and I'd, I'd write, you know, a, a, a topical poem about you know, an aspect of the day, and yet I have to get gags in. But as I said before, I didn't want to sacrifice the quality of my poetry merely as a vehicle, to use it as a vehicle for my sense of humour, so I stopped doing that. And now do you, do I you think you'll ever like, achieve anything through it? Is it, you know, will it make people think differently, or do you want it to make people think differently, or do you just want it to make them think? That's not a bad bit. No, I don't want to make, it, make them think differently. I wouldn't mind making them think, though, you know? <laughs> but I don't want them to think mm. differently, you know? It's, you know, I mean, maybe when I was younger, I kind of had these, like, you know, high ideals, you know, I want to be remembered in a hundred years' time, and, you know, but, I, that's, I, you know, I don't really, I don't really, if I am, then good, but, you know, I don't, it's something I don't really think about now. I'm sorry. Okay, let's talk a little more about your background. Emma, you've got a question on that. Yeah, um, growing up in a predominantly white area, was it Council Farm? Yeah, I grew up yeah. in Council Farm, yeah. Um, did you get any racial prejudice there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you know, Council Farm, yeah, it was kind did, of heavy. Yeah. But I moved to Waverley then and then to Toxteth, you know, so I don't actually class myself as being from one area in Liverpool. Yeah. So it was my ice rattling. Did that kind of prejudice help to single you out as well? Like the poetry helped to single you out? Yeah, it must have done. It kind of, it kind of made, it kind of made me say, I want to show you. I so want you think to show that's what's you. helped to make you then? Well, I think, you know, everyone is a product of their environment. Yeah. And, you know, I'm a product of mine, you know. I'm black scouser, you know. Yeah. And I suppose I've got all the personality traits that go with that. Yeah. Ali? So do you never wish you could just be one of a crowd and melt in? You like being an individual? I don't know. The way you hear the seating arrangements today kind of uh, <laughs> <laughs> don't kind of help me be one of a crowd, do they? Um, I kind of, I'm kind of at the stage now where I'm kind of quite comfortable with who I am. I went through a stage a few years ago where, you know, I kind of started looking into myself and sort of uh, was not quite happy with who I am. But I've kind of learned to accept myself, you know, accept my kind of natural ebullience. So do you think you'd have had a different character if you hadn't been brought up in the situation that you were? Well, obviously I would have, yeah. I mean, you know, if I would have even if I would have grown up with Coventry, <laughs> <laughs> I would have had a different personality, you know. You are products of your environment and I'm a product of mine, you know, and, and you know, I'm no one special. I'm just, like, a dude, I go to the match, you know, I read the, I read the mirror, you know, I, uh, I'm just a person. What along there? My flatmate's actually from Coventry and she's perfectly nice, thank you. What? <laughs> <laughs> you, got wrong, you got the wrong end of the stick, did you? No, <laughs> but to get, to get on to the question, um, do you find having moved around different places that you blend in a lot easier? You make more of an effort to be accepted in more places well, and you come across as really quite friendly and making an effort to be liked. Do you reckon um, it's because you've moved so often? <coughs> It could be. I've never really thought about it. But you're, you're right about I've always kind of wanted to be liked, you know? I mean, um, you know, being someone who's different in school and all that and, like, you know, getting all this stick and lip and mouth from the lads, you'd always kind of, you know, try to make them want to like me a bit more, you know? Can I play with your ball? Can I be in your gang? And, uh, yeah, so I suppose that's because I was different. I don't know. It's, I have to go into analysis, really, to find the, the deep-rooted complexities of my nature, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, treat this as an opportunity. <laughs> sort of analysis, Michael. Okay, did you, at, at school, yeah. Did you ever be? Were you like the centre of attraction? You know, everyone coming around you. Oh, look at his hair. Ah, oh, and playing in your hair and stuff. Yeah, and let them see how long it is when I stretch it. And that's <laughs> it. Um, did you like all this stuff? Uh, well, no, it was never like that. It was a, in Liverpool. It's not like that. You oh. know, it's kind of a, It was a bit tougher than that. You know, it wasn't just about me. Yeah, you know, it was. But um, I didn't mind. I mean, I, I wasn't the centre of attraction. I was, you, you know, you got you get a group of mates and all that. And I was, I don't know, I must be quite bright because, you know, we'd all be having a giggle at the back of the class. And at the end of the results, I'd be on A's and these guys would be on F's. 
so the teacher obviously saw me as a disruptive influence and kind of moved me away, you know, so. So, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't you, know everything. Did I'm you sorry. Did you against you say, yeah, he's just fooling us or something like that? Well, let's, no. let's beat him up or something. Yeah. <laughs> no, my mates were so thick, they didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's complaints from all your mates, no? <laughs> all right. Uh, you've got very prominent public images. That's something you work at, or is that in Have reality? I? The real Craig Charles. What, what is my very prominent public image? Well, probably simply the very charismatic Liverpudlian who like, <laughs> confuses <laughs> me. <laughs> what you see is what you get. No, I, I've, 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 I don't know. Um, what you see is what you get. I've, I've never really consciously kind of tried to adapt an image, to tell you the truth, you know. I mean, so one week I'm in a suit and shirt and tie looking pretty smart, you know what I mean? And the next week I'm in my jeans and my trainers and hoping to get finished so I can go to match. <laughs> no. I mean, are there any characters that you've played that you relate to very strongly at all? I kind of relate to Lister a lot. I mean, Lister in Red Dwarf is kind of me. <laughs> I'm ashamed to say. Well, look, let's get into comedy a bit more and comedy itself, what, what your views are on that. Ernest, you've got a question on that. Yeah, I was just wondering if you'd uh, ever bombed out on stage or anything like oh, that, what? you know. Or, or you had a, a really hard crowd or something that just didn't give you any laughs. Oh, completely. I, I mean, you know, you're not a comedian unless you've, like, bombed out on stage, as far as I'm concerned, you know? Well, can uh, you tell us about any of that? Well, I used to do this Red Wedge thing, you know, Red Wedge was kind of like trying to get... Uh, to kind of create a socialist platform for artists to kind of... Uh, to put across their work. And I... Um, did a gig in Leeds. Leeds, so good they named it once. And I was, like, um, doing this gig in Leeds, and... I, it was, like, it was full of... A very radical feminist audience. And I, I kind of... I kind of thought, well, I'll go on and talk about this, this poem I used to do called Brewer's Droop, which was, um... Have you got a friend from Leeds? It's quite nice as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it was kind of a, a very radical feminist sort of, um, audience. And I kind of thought, well, I'll go on. I used to do this poem called Brewer's Droop, which is all about, you know, the effects of lager on the, on the, on the male anatomy and how, you know, the, I was trying to show that men are human and, and, and susceptible. So I go on and start talking about me, will you? And they just see it as he's talking about his Willie, his chairs were flying, <laughs> and glasses were flying, and these, you know... We just about got out of there, man. Yes. I'm following on to the feminist bit as yeah. well. Would you sort of join the machoism against feminists, or do you no. sympathise with some of their causes? I'd yeah. sympathise with a lot of their causes, yeah. I'm just saying there was a radical feminist audience and they didn't appreciate me talking about my Willie. <laughs> I'm not surprised, basically, on a lot of the feminist issues but that you get now. Well, I kind of did cut out half of the audience from me talking about my Willie. But it was kind of trying to say that my you know, Willie doesn't get hard sometimes, you know. <laughs> and, like, it was kind of saying, you know, you know, men are, 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 have their failings and are failures and are not the stronger sex. Tony? Uh, <clears throat> would you see being in the public eye and being seen as a comedian that you have to tell jokes the whole time? No. People are People are disappointed if you don't. Most comedians you meet are all miserable gits. They really are, you know, really miserable. Um, I'm kind of one of the only comedians I know who kind of laughs at other people's jokes, you know. Um, I was in Frank... Uh, I was in Frank Carson a couple of nights ago, in fact, and he was like... He just... All the time, cracking jokes, all the time, all the time, you know. And I'm not like that, really, you know. I'm, in fact, I don't... I'm not one of those... I'm not a gaggy comedian, you know. Like, you know, I, I kind of... Do you try to be funny, is it, or is it just sort of the way you are? I, I, I try and be me, you know, and if I'm funny, I'm funny. I mean, but sometimes you bomb out, you know, sometimes you misjudge an audience, you misread your audience, you know, or, you're, you know, your timing's off, you know, you blow it. And I've blown it loads of times, believe me. You know? Some of the people who, who emerged around the same time as you, the, people are now, there's an almost revisionist attitude to some of the comedy that came out at the time. People are going, they weren't that funny after all. How do you feel about all that, what was at the time called alternative comedy, now looking back on it? I am ashamed in some ways, simply because, and I am not a part of, I mean, Saturday Night Live, the first series of Saturday Night Live, which was a gloriously good series, I thought, right. And um, it was me, Harry Enfield, Ben Elton, Flying Laurie, and... Uh, I, a lot of it was all about putting down the generation before, the old northern club comedians. It was all about slagging them down. They're not funny. They're sexist. They're racist. They're this. They're that. And now, you, you never see Jimmy Tarbuck on television. You never see Bernard Manning on television. And yet we're all doing quite well, thank you. And I kind of don't think that was right, you know. I don't think that telling preaching to the nation saying this is wrong and this is right 
is, is right, you know. And it wasn't very professional. And it was slagging down fellow comedians. And from a great northern club tradition. And uh, I think that was wrong. Was it the south of England? It was very southernist. It was very kind of, you know, London versus the north, you know. And, you know, it was very university educated comedians, you know. It was very like that. And, like, um, I never went to university, you know. I wasn't, I don't see myself as part of that. I was the young kid amongst them, you know. But I, th I think it was very wrong, you know. And, you know, sometimes I see some of these old comedians and things like that, and they, they, they give me some stick about it. Some of, them, some of the, the comedians you're talking about preach more than others. Do you find them offensive now? I'm kind of glad that uh, there's been a backlash against it. And now the new alternative comedian is to be really sick, isn't it? You know, it's not about being right on, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, vote Labour. It's not about that anymore. You sounded a bit like Ben Elton when you did that. Is that... Uh... <laughs> did, 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 what, are you trying to draw me? I'm not looking, <laughs> I've just said I'm not into slagging down fellow professionals, so... I'm not going to slag down anyone. But the new, you know, the new, the new alternative is the alternative to Ben. That's what I'm saying. Which is back to the old, you know, sickness, you know? What's that impersonation of? Eric Clapton's babysitter, you know what I mean? It's about <laughs> being sick again, do you know what I mean? And like, you know, and like, see, you didn't want to laugh, but you did. Do you know what I mean? That's comedy, that's funny, you know? When you don't want to laugh, but you do. Then you know it's really funny. It doesn't, to me, it doesn't really matter about the political kind of connotations of it, you know? Okay, um, I'm let some people get in here. Let's say. Um, do you think the fact that comedians like Ben Elton people have now been discredited um, has, uh, excuse, has me, like, excuse me, discredited as what? Well, as people people now believe that um, their kind of champagne socialism is false because they've got on so much in the world. People distrust them. Do you think that's cut out the whole idea of politics and comedy, or do you still think you can get actual funny men like Jeremy Hardy who can also be political at the same time? Do you think there's still a role for serious comment in comedy? Or do you think, you know, we're just going to go and have just, like, sickness now? No, J Jeremy's very self-effacing. He's a, he's a very self-effacing comedian. I mean, you know, a lot of his jokes are about his white middle classes, you know? So he uses his background to the best of his ability. Um, I, I, I don't think it's just going to be all sickness. I still think there's room for political comedy. I mean, but, you know... I mean, I did a joke in my act. It was like, you know, I did it in front of Paul Boateng and Bernie Grant. It's like, it was, they were all there. I mean, it's nice to see these new black MPs in power, you know? Stand up, Bernie, take a bow to the audience. Stand up, Paul, take a bow to the audience. It's nice to see these new black MPs in power, because I think black people deserve the same opportunity as white people to set out the working class. <laughs> Do you know, I mean, that's just, I mean, you know, you, you can have polit political jokes still. I, I just don't know if that hard, banging on the head, <coughs> be a socialist, vote Labour, is going to work anymore. Because as you say, all those guys that did it are all millionaires. So you think the way is more subtle, it's more satire, yeah. and it's more like satirising the status quo rather than actually putting forward a party line than that? Def satire is definitely back in again. Satire and single-breasted suits. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, boy, you'll not be on here again. <laughs> of this side. Craig, you don't do sexist jokes or racist jokes, but do you believe there is a place for such things, or do you disapprove of comedians that I think make there's a place jokes? for all comedy, you know? I don't, I, I don't like uh, it when it's used as a weapon. And a, as a way, I, I've seen like Bernard Manning work, and where he's like he's a very, very funny man, you know. He really is. Like, his time is impeccable. I wish I had Bernard Manning's time, and I'd be a lot richer and probably a lot fatter. <laughs> no, but <laughs> but um, I did a Wogan with Bernard Manning, and he was just doing black jokes all the time, trying to get at me. And when it's used as a divisive uh, sort of weapon, when he's brandishing his sense of humour as a sword against you. Then it's wrong, you know. I could have gone on with Bernard Manning on Wogan and done like uh, fat jokes. Bernard Manning so fat he was born the eighth, ninth, and tenth of June. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Bernard Manning so fat you get lifted them, you better be going down. I mean, I could have just like done a load of fat jokes, but I kind of decided to not get into that game. I mean, jokes are jokes, and if you're a good comedian, you've got the jokes, you've got the armory there. It's a case of using it, you know, to its, you know, to its best effect. And I think there's, you know, cause for racist jokes and sexist jokes, but in the right environment, you know, and not used as a divisive weapon. Black people are different than white people. Women are different than men. Do you know what I mean? And, you know, I don't know if it's sexism to discuss the differences between our natures. I don't know if that is sexist. I do a routine now about vaginas, you know? I don't know if we can say this when this show goes out. <laughs> but, you know, it's, and like env environmentally friendly sex. And I've done this vagina routine in front of, like, you know, radical feminists who've all thought it was 
pretty funny because it's just because you know if you grew up in the 80s you wouldn't know what a vagina was you know because every right on person your stand-up comic the routine about penises and how funny they were and how they fell down that way and they loved that way and they didn't stand up in the right situations but no one ever talked about vaginas you know so come to see me show <laughs> <laughs> I, I just i just want you know is there is there a major difference between a racist joke and, and a joke about someone who's fat well, no, it's not really. It's just that, no, not really. I don't do fat jokes either. Mm. I, said, I, said, I said I knew the jokes. I didn't say I, I did them. I, didn't no, I just think them. in terms of, of the offence and, and the danger, the dangerous element in jokes like that. Yeah. You know? I think, you know, I, comedy, at the end of the day, should take no prisoners, you know? Should take no prisoners. But, uh, okay, you know, no, fair enough. there's no hard and fast rules, is there, you know? I, I don't know. Why are you asking me? Well, you're the expert. <laughs> Down the back here. Uh, do you think that comedy can be too offensive? I mean, Jerry Sadowitz was recently kind of punched on stage because he was a... a well, he was considered No end of good as well. <laughs> yeah. um, I think the guy hitting him was wrong, you know? You don't think the public sh should have uh, a right to reply to comedians? Jerry, Jerry is... Jerry Sadowitz, he is, he, is he is the backlash to Ben Elton, you know? He is that new, sick, alternative... To, to the right on, you know, you know. I don't agree with you, but I'll defend your right to say it, you know. I mean, <laughs> oh, that annoys me, you know. I mean, so, yeah, I mean, he's a good working class lad, and he's sick. And, you know, he's the backlash to it, you know. We asked for it. We give all the other, other dudes millions of pounds, didn't we? So we asked for it, you know, and now we're getting it. <laughs> well, that's it. You seem to be quite kind of liberal in your view to comedy. You're, you say there's a place for every form of comedy, for racist I'm not comedy, for shoot me in the comedy head. And, and all the rest of it. But like, do you not know think it can be such a powerful weapon that in any form it could backfire? You might think you're giving racist comedy to the right audience, but it's still, in whatever form you're doing it, it's encouraging some kind of divisiveness. What, and it's what, still what? keeping people apart. Do you not know think until we get rid of this kind of comedy, you're not. I'm going to batter you later, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Now we've got the quote we wanted. <laughs> um, what are we talking about racism here? I mean, like, are we talking black, white? Are we talking French, Germans, Belgians? We're talking, well, Belgians are funny simply because Belgium, you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, what are, we, what are we talking like, well, you know, Germans being the first to beat the beast, issue, beast where, 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 Wherever seems to be kind of discrimination from one party against another, How, wh whatever way your comedy is intended, if it encourages and, like, continues this, this division, then the vision's not going to disappear. Mm. I kind of think sick jokes only work when you laugh as an involuntary response and then think, I wish I hadn't laughed. <laughs> That's when sick comedy works. When you laugh as an involuntary response and the laughter button gets tickled just a little bit. Big laugh. What am I laughing at? And that's where Jerry Sadovitz works a lot. You know, he, did, he, did, he used to do that. Nelson Mandela, what a git. Let some people a five year and never see them again. <laughs> do you know what I mean? You're laughing and think, oh. Do you know what I mean? Because comedy should bypass all this political stuff. I mean, you know, it, it should. Obviously, it doesn't, you know, but it, it, it kind of should in an ideal world, but, you know, we don't... I know no, we could get it. I mean, I've just noticed, I mean, some people laughed and some people didn't, you know? And... Yeah, OK, but, I mean, if I did that in a gig, you know, I saw Jay do it in a gig and... Uh, everyone laughed, even me, and then... Again, again, though, it doesn't bypass a political aspect when it's used towards political ends, like your red wedge or whatever it was. Yeah, well, it was a failure, you know. Well, Labour Party aren't in, are they? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's just because they're a failure, too. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> oh, well, with some of the work you've done recently, like uh, Them and Us, do you <laughs> feel that you're being stereotyped into a sort of man of the people type person? I've only done one kind of Them and Us show, you know. I did one series of that, I've done five series of Red Dwarf. I don't feel as though I'm being stereotyped into some kind of complete smeghead. It's, it's just <laughs> the, the, way you, the way you go on, you're sort of trying to be like just one of the, one of the people and you're not sort of standing out like the likes of I don't know like Ben Elton there who's seen as a, <laughs> an intellectual but why is here? Ben Elton being mentioned all the time on my open to question <laughs> hey I never got one mention on his <laughs> do you not feel that you've used coming from Liverpool as a positive tool like you've actually become a professional scouser because because I haven't changed my accent no because you seem to come across as someone who's practiced being Liverpudling. You're, you're, you, seem, you seem to me too Liverpool for no, Liverpool. No, this is, this, is, this is a very northern, this is a very northernest thing here, you know? People who come from Liverpool get, no matter where you come from, it doesn't matter if you come from Liverpool, you're a professional scouser. I mean, 
I haven't changed my accent, no. I haven't kind of bowed down to this southernish kind of university educated, you must talk like that and be an actor, you know. I haven't bowed down to that. I've decided to stick with my accent. I mean, I could have tried to change it, but I've stuck with my accent. But I, I, why does me talking in a Liverpool accent automatically me be... Am I banging on about Liverpool all the time? No, I'm not. I'm just, I speak with a Liverpool accent, so therefore I'm a professional scouser. So, I mean, that really annoys me. It really, really does annoy me that, you know. Um, and then if I would have changed my accent and started talking, like, you know, kind of nicely, I would have sold out. So, you know, where do you win? You know, it's a really regionalist thing you're saying there. And, like, regionalism really annoys me. Well, I live in London now, you know. So a lot of people in Liverpool say I've sold out because I live in London. You know, because oh, I, I go... I'm not trying to say that, that. I'm just trying to say that's the way I've heard a lot of people talking saying that that's the way you've come across to them. I mean, I'm from Dundee, I can't speak about anybody having a regional <laughs> accent, come on. But, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't know, what is a professional scouser? I don't know, that's just, that's a, well, a so, phrase you know, I've heard. But, uh, I am a scouser and I am a professional, I suppose, so... I suppose in a way I am. <laughs> you know. um, before you're going on about being an accidental person with no kind of career design, well, in a newspaper article at the end of that quote, you went on to say that you're just waiting for your fall. Yeah, kind of. which, which newspaper article was this? <laughs> what, have you been briefed? <laughs> 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 no, um, I've just like read stuff on you in the past and um Why do you think that um you're waiting for your fall? I mean you seem so outwardly confident. Um, right. do you really have an inner pessimism like that? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, I came, you know, I, I thought this could have been it today. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, this is a confrontational show, you know? It's like, you know, people come on and I've, I've seen people rip, to, I've seen people leaving this programme in tears, you know? And then, um, yeah, because it, it's all going so nicely for me. That's what I mean. You know, I, I'm so lucky, it's, you know. I thought I had to fall later on this year when I got really ill. Not this year, last year when I got ill. I got a uh, thing called Bell's Palsy. Does anyone know what that is? Yeah, well, I got it. It's like when the, the seventh... I'm an expert now. You know, when you get ill, you suddenly become an expert about what your particular illness is, you know? I got, got this kind of Bell's palsy where the left-hand side of my face was, like, completely paralysed. And, like, it can last forever on some people. Some people can have it for, like, you know, uh, two years. Some people can have it for two months, and I had it for a month, so I was really lucky. I thought that was my fault. But what I mean is it's all going so nice for me, and I'm, I'm doing well, I'm earning a bit of money, I'm getting out and about and seeing the world, and, you know... Why me? You know, why am I so lucky? I mean, I'm no, I'm, I'm no extra special person, you know? I haven't got, like, a university education. I'm not extremely why? bright, you know? Why just take this look, as you call it, as um, something that was meant to happen to you rather than thinking, you know... As a sign from God. <laughs> <laughs> well, whatever you want to think. Don't yeah. you think, can't you just take it and be pleased with it rather than looking at the pessimistic side? Well, I, I kind of... Yeah, I do, but I'll, I'll do it more for you, thanks. Thanks for the advice. <laughs>